again. I'd like to welcome all of you as well. Look around you, all of us, we're gathered here once more. Just to listen to the speak, speaker of the day. And here he is, David Robertson from DTU. He has some things to say. Hey, hey, hey. On planar grounds and homomorphism counts and quantum mechanics, anything you want to know. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. All right, well, thank you very much. That was nice. Um, so, um, as Sophia said, I'll, I'll talk about um, what graph linearity and homomorphism counts have to do with the quantum mechanics. Um, I guess it's somewhat provocative title, um, but I think it's a, a quite interesting result. Uh, so, the, the talk is uh, based on the assumption that you've all read all three of these papers. Um, now, um, so these are just some, some of the papers uh, that I'll be sort of mentioning, uh, or rather I'll be mentioning the results from some of these papers. So the, the main result that I'll be talking about is from this first paper um, with Laura and Menchinska. Um, and then uh, it's, uh, it's using a connection between uh, quantum isomorphism, which is kind of a notion from quantum information, and quantum groups, which we established in this middle paper uh, with Martino as well. Uh, and uh, this bottom paper is just the paper where we defined uh, quantum isomorphisms of graphs. <clears throat> uh, can everyone hear me okay? And uh, everything's good? Okay. Uh, so the the result, uh, it touches on a few different topics. So if there's something that someone doesn't understand, of course, please just stop me and I can explain it in more detail. Um, I can't go through, I'm not gonna go through the whole proof uh, in detail just because of time, but if you have some questions about some part, then you can always ask me at the end. And I have some extra slides as well. I can maybe uh, uh, go into detail using those. <clears throat> All right, so I'm gonna start by um, introducing quantum isomorphism, uh, but not quite in the way that I introduced it in the abstract. So in the abstract, I talked about uh, introducing it in terms of these non-local games. Um, but I'll actually start kind of backwards. I'm going to first introduce it in terms of a nice algebraic formulation, and also in the context of some other uh, relaxations of graph isomorphism that have nice algebraic formulations. Um, and then from there, I'll, I'll start talking about the, uh, the isomorphism game and, uh, and show how these are equivalent. Well, I'll just say that they're equivalent. Uh, this is, I guess, chronologically somehow, uh, somehow backwards, but uh, I think maybe for, for this crowd, it's uh, the right approach. Uh, and then I'll talk about homomorphism counts and how it relates to uh, the first part. And then the second half of the talk, I will talk about some parts of the proofs uh, that I think will be the most interesting to the people here. So. All right, so what's an isomorphism? Well, it's sort of the thing you would expect it to be for graphs, right? It's just when the two graphs are the same, but you just kind of relabel the vertices, right? So formally, it's um, a bijection between the vertex sets of two graphs um, that preserves adjacency and non-adjacency. Uh, I think everyone is used to this little tilde to mean adjacency. Um, but, but just in case you're on, can everyone see my cursor? Or no? Yeah, okay. Um, all right. And of course, when we can find an isomorphism, we say the graphs are isomorphic and we write this little congruent symbol. Um, okay, so that's the definition, but there's actually a nice algebraic way of defining this in, in terms of permutation matrices. So we say that uh, two, graphs are, two, uh, two graphs are isomorphic if and only if you can find a permutation matrix P that satisfies this equation. So you probably are used to seeing the equation on the, on the right. Um, so here, A sub G is the adjacency matrix of G and A sub H is the adjacent matrix of H. Um, and this conjugation by this permutation matrix P is just reordering the rows and columns of your adjacency matrix to obtain the adjacency matrix of the, the other graph. So of course, if you can do that, it's the same as relabeling your vertices. 
Um, so then it's sort of natural to take this algebraic definition and ask how can we relax it? So we have this uh, requirement that P is a permutation matrix, uh, but what about some, some other requirement that's not quite as strong? Um, and then maybe this gives us some interesting uh, relations on graphs. Uh, so the first one uh, that I'll mention is this fractional isomorphism, which is where we just replace permutation matrix with doubly stochastic matrix. Um, and this is why I have this uh, equation with the permutation matrix written uh, as a sub g times p equals p times a sub h, because um, the other way of writing it, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't give you, um, it doesn't give you the same uh, nice uh, relation of fractional isomorphism. So here, uh, I can't just move this doubly stochastic matrix over to the other side because it's not necessarily invertible. Um, so this is a very nice uh, uh, relation that uh, is natural because this doubly stochastic matrix matrices, these are just the convex hull of the permutation matrices. Um, and you can think of it as like a linear relaxation of isomorphism and so you can you can determine it in polynomial time and I'll just say that there is very many uh, different characterizations of this uh, fractional isomorphism um, including uh, very nice combinatorial ones um, and also in terms of the logic and a few other types of things. Another uh, relation you can you can get by relaxing the notion of permutation matrix is uh, co-spectrality which I guess everyone who does algebraic graph theory is familiar with so here, instead of a permutation matrix, we just require that the matrix is unitary. So of course the permutation matrix is unitary, but if we just require that it's unitary, then we get that the, the graphs are co-spectral, meaning their adjacency matrices have the same eigenvalues. Um, okay, so seeing these examples, what's another way that we could relax the notion of a permutation matrix? Uh, and the way that, one way that we'll see is that we can kind of think of a operator relaxation. So in a permutation matrix, my entries are just some numbers, uh, real or complex numbers, however you want to think about it. Uh, but what if I had a matrix whose entries are actually uh, some elements from some, uh, some algebra? In this case, I'll uh, require that the elements of a C star algebra, if you don't know what a C star algebra is, um, you can think of it as the uh, as a subalgebra of bounded linear operators on a Hilbert space, and if that's still a little too um, uh, a little uh, outside your comfort zone, just pretend that it's some sort of a matrix algebra, and that's for the intuition's sake, that's that's good enough. Um, okay, so I have some matrix whose entries are these algebra elements, and what I want is that. Uh, each entry is a projection. So I mean, I mean, it squares to itself and it's equal to uh, its, its star. So in a C star algebra, we always have this star operation. For a matrix, this is just conjugate transpose. Uh, the other thing I require is that if I sum along the rows or the columns of this matrix, I get the identity operator or the identity element of my algebra. Um, right, okay, and so, we call this a quantum permutation matrix. And you can see why. Um, because this first condition that the, the entries squared themselves, if my entries were just complex numbers, then this just means that my entries are zero, one. Right? And then the second condition says that there's exactly one, one in every row and column. And so this is exactly a permutation matrix. Um, OK, and then. Uh, this is how we are going to, in this talk, define quantum isomorphism as just saying that there is some quantum permutation matrix that satisfies this equation. Uh, so it's the same equation as for isomorphism, but for, with a quantum permutation matrix. In this case, actually, we can move the quantum permutation matrix over because, although maybe it's not obvious uh, from this definition, uh, it's always going to be a unitary matrix. And I guess I should point out that, okay, this a sub G, this is a matrix of just uh, regular of numbers, real numbers or complex numbers. Whereas this curly P matrix is a matrix of uh, whose entries are elements of an algebra. So how do you multiply these things? Well, I just, if I look at the IJ entry of this product, I'm just thinking of it as uh, a sum of uh, sort of the, 
the entries, the scalar entries from a sub g times the algebra element from p. So I can always multiply a scalar by an algebra element. Uh, and so that's fine. And then I can sum them up. So it, that's how I'm interpreting this product when I write this. OK. Uh, I already sort of mentioned this, that if you have a, a quantum permutation matrix whose entries are from the complex numbers, then you just get a, a permutation matrix. Um, and I think that this, uh, this notion of quantum permutation matrix is natural enough on its own to be interesting. This is, uh, I mean, obviously we, we came across it coming from uh, looking at these not strategies for non-local games. Uh, but if someone told me this notion, I, I think I would think it's somewhat interesting, uh, even if I didn't know this other interpretation. Um, and it also comes up, it turns out, in quantum groups. This is where it was first defined. They call it a magic unitary in the, in the quantum group literature, but it's the same thing. Um, this might not be obvious uh, from the definition, but quantum isomorphism is stronger than both fractional isomorphism and cospectrality. Um, so uh, for cospectrality, actually, this follows because a quantum permutation matrix is always unitary. Okay, so that's a nice notion, but are there any graphs that are quantum isomorphic but not isomorphic, right? Because if not, then who cares? Um, and in fact, this was, from the first paper, this was the hardest part. We had this notion and could prove some nice properties about it for quite some time, uh, but we, we couldn't figure out how to construct graphs that are uh, quantum isomorphic but not isomorphic. Um, and then for, for that, we actually, uh, uh, needed some help from Albert at Sirius. Um, and uh, he sort of helped us figure out how to do that. Now, the two graphs here, so hopefully I think everyone can see, obviously they're not isomorphic, right? It's pretty clear, I think. Um, uh, but they are quantum isomorphic. Um, I won't go into detail to how, uh, into how we construct the graphs, but I, if you want to ask uh, after the talk, I have some extra slides that explains. I would just say that these are some very nice graphs here, actually. So these are Cayley graphs for S4. Um, and one of them actually is uh, the derangement graph. Um, I believe it's, it's this one, it's the derangement graph. So uh, these, these edges and these little four cliques here, um, these actually correspond to the uh, elements of S4 that are uh, these kind of like double transpositions, I would call them. So, um, the things whose cycle structure looks like two uh, die cycles. Uh, and then the edges going across uh, in this one are the four cycles. And then in the previous one, the edges going across are just the transpositions. So here uh, in the first one, the connection set are all the things that um, have order two. And in the second one, uh, the connection set is all the derangements. And I'll just remark that you can remove these edges and these four cliques, so these kind of double transpositions, and they stay not isomorphic, but still quantum isomorphic. Um, right. Okay, so um, now that we know that quantum isomorphism is a non-trivial relation, let's relate it to, uh, to uh, quantum mechanics. Um, so the, the, the basic idea here is to encode graph isomorphism into something called a non-local uh, non game. So the setup is that uh, we have two parties, Alice and Bob, and they're trying to convince a referee that the graphs G and H are isomorphic. Um, so uh, the referee is going to send Alice a vertex from G, let's say, and Bob a vertex from G. And then Alice is going to respond with a vertex from H, and Bob responds with a vertex from H. Um, and what we require is that um, they satisfy this condition that if the vertices from G that they received were adjacent, then they must reply with adjacent vertices of H. Similarly, if they were equal vertices of G, they were, must reply with equal vertices of H. And if they were distinct non-adjacent vertices from G, they reply with a distinct non-adjacent vertices from H. So this rel just means the, how the vertices are related. So equal, adjacent, or distinct non-adjacent. Uh, an important point is that they're not allowed to communicate during the game. So they're allowed to get together and um, devise a strategy before the game starts. But once the game starts, they can't talk to each other. 
Um, so they, they only require to play one so-called round of the game, uh, but we require that they have to win that round with probability one. Uh, another way of thinking about it is if uh, we require that whatever strategy they're using, it guarantees that they win no matter what uh, input they receive from the referee. Um, and this is kind of an important point because if they have to play many rounds, of course the referee can just ask them every vertex of the, of the graphs and then record what they, they're mapping them to and then tell, no matter whether they have a classical or quantum strategy, they're never gonna be able to win unless the graphs actually are isomorphic. Okay, and then it's, uh, it's not so hard to see that if, you, if the graphs are isomorphic, then you can win it perfectly because you just respond according to your isomorphism. You give me a vertex from, uh, from G and then I just see where this isomorphism maps it to an H and I respond according to that and this will always win. And the other direction is uh, also not so hard to see because once you have some perfect classical strategy, it essentially boils down to being a function for each party that maps the vertices of G to the vertices of H. Um, I should point out that um, I actually do allow the referee to ask um, the, the part, the Alice and Bob vertices from the other graph as well. So they also have to be able to go the other way around. Um, and that prevents you from just having an isomorphism to a subgraph. But the conditions are the same. Okay, so since we've captured this notion of isomorphism in terms of this game, uh, now let's, for, in terms of classical strategies, now we want to look at quantum strategies. So what, what does it mean to have a quantum strategy for this game? Um, so what it means is that we have our uh, two parties, Alice and Bob, and they share some quantum system that's in some state psi. Uh, and I'm going to kind of give a general overview of what a quantum strategy is first before getting into the mathematical details. So they have a quantum system in state psi. And then whenever Alice receives a vertex uh, little g, she performs some measurement, which can depend on her input. Uh, and then depending on how this, uh, the outcome of this measurement, she, uh, she's gonna respond according to, to whatever outcome she got. Uh, Bob's gonna do the same thing, essentially. He has some measurement uh, f sub g prime. And then he responds accordingly. So what does this mean that they share a system in the, a quantum system in the state psi? It just means that uh, psi is some unit vector in a, some Hilbert space. Um, if, uh, if you like, you can just think it's a, a complex unit vector. Uh, and then this measurement, uh, E sub G, this is just a collection of uh, positive semi-definite operators that sum up to identity. And these, uh, the elements in this collection of operators are indexed by the outcomes, which are just the, the vertices of H. So whenever you do a measurement, you get some outcome, uh, some measurement operator outcome, and which in this case is indexed by a vertex of H, and you respond with that vertex. Bob uh, has the same sort of thing. The other thing we require is that all of Alice's operators from her measurements commute with all of Bob's operators. And then what happens is that if they play according to this strategy, it's not gonna be a deterministic strategy in, uh, in general, um, but their outcomes are gonna um, follow this probability distribution. So uh, the probability that Alice and Bob output little h, little h prime, assuming they were given little g, little g prime, is equal to this inner product here. Um, and, <clears throat> So you can, um, you can see that um, since these, uh, these operators are positive semi-definite and they commute, this will always be non-negative and they will, it will add up to one if you sum over H and H prime. Um, so this is what's called the, the commuting operator framework for um, performing uh, measurements on a joint system. So there's another framework that's also sometimes studied which is called the tensor product framework. And it's the, it will be the same exact thing, but in that case, uh, instead of just this regular matrix product here between the E's and F's, you would take a tensor product. Uh, and that's slightly more restrictive. Um, but for, for this talk, we're gonna focus on this one. Um, okay. <clears throat> okay, and then the theorem of course is that 
well, you can win this game perfectly with a quantum strategy if and only if the graphs are quantum isomorphic according to this definition I gave earlier in terms of quantum permutation matrices. <clears throat> Okay, so this is how we relate this nice algebraic formulation with some sort of operational interpretation. I mean, in principle, this is something that can be done in the real world, um, where you have two separated parties and they have some shared quantum system and they can perform some joint measurements on this system. Uh, in fact, this is the type of thing that they really do to sort of like prove the non-locality of nature or whatever that means. Um, so, an important property of these quantum uh, strategies is that they're what's called non-signaling. And what this means is that, it doesn't, that even though it allows them to achieve some, some things that they can't achieve classically, it doesn't allow them just, to just simply communicate information to one, each, one another. Like, they cannot use this shared entangled state uh, to communicate information to the other party. So, Formally, what that means is that Alice's outcome cannot depend on uh, whatever Bob uh, was given from the referee. Um, and that just corresponds to these, these sums of these probabilities not depending on uh, a certain, uh, uh, the, certain of the uh, variables here. Okay, and then it's not hard to see that these quantum strategies really are non-signaling because if you just take, um, let's say, this first sum and you check, does it depend on G prime? Well, we plug in our formula for this probability. Uh, it's this inner product. And now we can bring our sum over H prime inside. And now we have that these have to sum up to identity because they form a quantum measurement. And so that goes away. And we end up with something that only depends on on G and H. So it doesn't depend on G prime at all. Okay. Um, and so what this kind of corresponds to physically, I guess, is that you could imagine a scenario where you have separated the parties far enough apart and required them to answer quickly enough that maybe it wouldn't be possible for them to communicate information to one another unless they could send it faster than the speed of light. And so this non-signaling condition is basically saying that, okay, if you only believe in the speed of light as a universal speed limit, then I can kind of guarantee that no matter what they're doing, even if they have some weird super quantum strategy, they, they won't break this condition. Um, and so it's sometimes interesting to then look, okay, what could you possibly do if you just require that the correlations that they are using are non-signaling? You drop that it has to be a quantum correlation, but you just impose this kind of mathematical uh, um, constraint on sums of these probabilities. And then what's nice is that you get that this is equivalent to fractional isomorphism. So you can play, win this isomorphism game with a non-signaling correlation if and only if the graphs are fractionally isomorphic. <coughs> I think that's quite nice. Um, okay, so now that's, that's sort of the quantum information, I guess, part of the talk. That's where these uh, kind of operational um, interpretation of what this quantum isomorphism is. Uh, you kind of, uh, you can convince some referee using quantum mechanics that, uh, um, that you are able to map two uh, graphs together, even though it sort of should, should be impossible. And sometimes, of course. Uh, but what does this have to do with counting homomorphism? Um, and this is kind of related to whether or not um, a graph theorist might care about this. So um, I think uh, this notion in terms of these games is quite nice. And also in terms of this matrix formulation for quantum permutation matrices. And probably for an algebraic graph theorist, this is interesting enough. Um, but I think if you're someone that does less algebraic type graph theory, maybe you, you don't find it so motivating uh, or, or you might say, okay, well, what does it really mean for two graphs to be quantum isomorphic? I mean, it's some weird algebraic thing, like why should I care, right? Um, but uh, since it turns out that we can actually formulate this in terms of counting homomorphisms, I think that's a much more kind of structural graph theory type of, um, type of condition, uh, which hopefully will, will interest some, some other people. Uh, 
Um, and it, some, this is somehow like um, something I've dealt with, I think, in, uh, in, in other talks where, before this result, where you try to gain the, uh, the interest of some graph theorists. And once you start talking about some weird quantum things, right, you can kind of see them take their phones out of their pockets or whatever, right? I mean, <laughs> um, but I mean, it makes sense because I mean, if you can't, if you can't motivate something in, in their language, then it's hard to, to uh, gain the interest of someone, of course. All right, but now we can, so that's great. Okay, so just so we're all on the same page, what's a, what's a homomorphism? Well, it's, um, it's just a function from the, the vertices of one graph to another that preserves adjacency. It doesn't have to be injective or anything like that. It doesn't have to preserve non-adjacency. It just preserves adjacency. So here's an example, um, mapping a seven cycle to a five cycle. We're kind of folding up this path of link three here. <coughs> And I'm going to use HOM of F comma G to denote the number of homomorphisms from F to G. And this really relates back to this really nice result of Lovas from, I guess, about 50 years, 53 years ago, um, where he showed that you can actually uh, determine a graph by counting homomorphisms. So two graphs are isomorphic if and only if they have the same number of homomorphisms for all graphs. Um, of course, one way is sort of obvious because the graphs are essentially the same, uh, but the other direction requires a bit of work. Um, I think he proved this when he was like 18 or 19 or something. Um, so I guess we have some catching up to do with Um And now there's also a, another really nice result that relates homomorphism counting to relations on graphs, and it relates it to cospectrality, which um, we talked about before. So two graphs are co-spectral if and only if uh, they have the same number of homomorphisms uh, from any cycle. And this is because the number of homomorphisms from cycles, this is just counting the, the closed walks in your graph. And this is just the traces of the powers of your adjacency matrix, which is just the sums of the powers of your eigenvalues, right? And if you have all of, uh, all of these sums, then you can determine the eigenvalues. Um, Okay, it's not usually, I think, explained in this way, but this is what's sort of happening here. And then there's this other uh, really nice result that characterizes fractional isomorphism in this way. It's actually was first proved by uh, Dvorak in 2010, um, but I heard about it because it, the, from this Delgro Rattan paper where they, they prove it independently. I think they found out later that Dvorak had already proven it. Um, so they can show that they're fractional isomorphic if and only if they have the same number of homomorphisms from uh, any tree. Um, and actually they prove something much more general because there's this kind of hierarchy of relaxations of isomorphism known as this weissweiler lehmann hierarchy where the first level is fractional isomorphism. And as you go up, you get closer to isomorphism. And as you go each level, sort of the kth level in this hierarchy corresponds to counting homomorphisms from graphs of tree width at most k. Um, and so this is, I think, a, a really beautiful result. And then uh, our result, um, I don't know why I have the questions mark because, I mean, it's obvious from the title what the answer is. Uh, so we showed that two graphs are quantum isomorphic if and only if they have the same number of homomorphisms from any planar graph. Um, and I mean, okay, I think maybe this is somewhat remarkable. I think, I think it's just pretty cool for one thing. Um, like why should, why should this notion uh, related to, you know, uh, playing some game with a quantum strategy have anything at all to do with counting homomorphisms or planar graphs um, or, or really anything that's so kind of combinatorial in a sense. Um, and that's not, it's certainly not something where we set out to prove this statement and figure out how, like, that would, be, that would be nuts if we said, oh yeah, obviously it should be equivalent to some counting homomorphism uh, notion and let's just figure out what it should be and, and prove it. Um, uh, so it's very surprising in that, in that sense, I think. Uh, I was surprised. Um, and the other thing is that uh, I think it puts it in this nice context of these other homomorphism counting results. Um, uh, and also, even in this Delgro Rattan paper, they actually asked about, okay, what happens if we count homomorphisms from planar graphs? Uh, is the relation equivalent to isomorphism? Um, 
and what's the complexity of deciding this relation, whatever it is. Um, and this shows that it's not equal to isomorphism, it's equal to quantum isomorphism. Okay. Um, as an added bonus, we previously had shown that quantum isomorphism is undecidable. Um, and this means that if I give you two graphs and I ask you, is there some planar graph that has a different number of homomorphisms to these two graphs, this is an undecidable problem. Um, so, I mean, maybe this doesn't seem so surprising because there's an infinite number of planar graphs, um, but many other relations uh, where there's an infinite number of things to check still turn out to be decidable or even polynomial time. This fractional isomorphism, there's an infinite number of trees, but actually you can determine it in polynomial time. Co-spectrality, obviously there's an infinite number of cycles, but you can determine it in polynomial time. Uh, but for whatever reason, for planar graphs, it's undecidable. Um, I guess there's not so many uh, nice undecidable problems in uh, sort of finite graph theory. Um, so that's another nice thing about it. I'm sorry, David. Um, the, the, does it, so it's undecidable. Does that mean that it just can't be determined in polynomial time? No, no, it's as in there's no algorithm which if I give you as inputs these graphs, like it will give you, it's guaranteed to terminate with an answer. So, I mean, of course you can, one, one way you can, like if they're not, uh, if they're not um, quantum isomorphic, then you can, you can just keep checking bigger and bigger planar graphs and eventually you'll find one um, right. that, uh, that has a different number. But if they are quantum isomorphic, then you, you'll never, like you won't necessarily ever, ever be able to tell that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, and the reduction is something like, um, the reduction is basically from this group, like this word problem for groups. In the end, it goes from word problem to groups, uh, reduces it to quantum isomorphism. It's, it uses a, a previous result of someone else and then a reduction of ours. Okay. Okay, so this is just kind of a summary of what we've seen so far. Um, so we have some relations over here on the left-hand side, and then across the top, we have sort of different ways of, of, of viewing them, I guess, right? So for isomorphism, uh, we look at permutation matrices, and then for this isomorphism game, it corresponds to classical strategies, and uh, it corresponds to counting homomorphisms from all graphs, and similar for quantum isomorphisms with quantum permutations, quantum strategies, and planar graphs. Fractional isomorphism is double stochastic matrices, non-signaling strategies and trees. And then co-spectrality is unitary matrices. And okay, there's a question mark here because I don't know if there's a nice uh, kind of class of strategies that corresponds to this. And then cycles. All right. Uh, I think that's the end of this part. So if there's any questions about uh, this part of the talk so far. Okay. Uh, oh, wait, sorry, okay. David, I have one, sorry. One yeah, uh, yes. on your last slide. Yeah. Have you, how much have you thought about this uh, co spectrality in terms of non local game strategies? Uh, not a lot. Um, yeah. I mean, it would certainly be interesting if you could do it. Um, yeah, I mean, it doesn't occur to me how, how exactly you, you should do that. Um, we might need to go kind of outside uh, any sort of notion of probability distribution because probably you're going to need some negative things around it to make sense um uh, right so i mean yeah um i think uh i i i can't imagine what the sort of kind of natural way of describing this in terms of the game would be but it would certainly be interesting if you could i don't know maybe you can somehow respond with vectors instead of uh instead of just uh, vertices or, or something like this um, but uh, it's not clear to me at all Strange about the question also is that co-spectrality would have to be like a larger class than quantum commuting, but not contained in non-signaling, I think. And so yeah, exactly. What, that even is right. that? what are we talking about? Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's why I was saying you're going to like somehow if you look on the level of these correlations, these probability distributions that you that you get when you're playing the game, um, they're, they're always non-negative because they're probability distributions. But you can imagine some like, you know, pseudo probability distribution that maybe has some negative uh, values somewhere. And 
because I don't think you're going to be able to get it without uh, having any sort of negative values in your correlation. Of course, maybe it's just not the right way of thinking about it at all. Maybe you should forget all about correlations and, and do something else. Yeah, maybe you go like, I don't want to spend a lot of time, but maybe you go like, you know, just looking at right arbitrary vectors, arbitrary operators. Yeah. Starting there. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah. It would be interesting if you can figure that out. So, um, so that's, that's some homework for the, for the class. Um, um, okay. There's also a, a question in the chat from Eric. Um, okay. Presumably in, in place of all graphs, planar graphs, cycles, trees, there may be other natural classes of graphs that would provide the same conclusion. Are such characterizations already known? Um, so, okay, yeah, I shouldn't mention. So I, as I mentioned, uh, this result about the trees, this is generalized to graphs of tree width at most K and the characterization is known in terms of this wise spider layman hierarchy. Um, and I guess another nice thing about that is that also this white sweater layman hierarchy is pretty heavily studied. So there's lots of characterizations of that in terms of other, uh, sort of in terms of logic or uh, uh, completely different types of games you can play on graphs, some pebble games. Um, so there's certainly uh, something there. More recently, uh, Martin Groa has a paper where he looks at um, instead of uh, tree width at most K, tree depth at most K. And he gives a characterization in terms of, um, in terms of logic, something about bounded quantifier depth uh, in terms of logic. So like somehow like, oh, okay, if, you're, if, you're, uh, if your graphs can be somehow distinguished by a, by a sentence or, or, or whatever in first order logic with bounded, with quantifier depth at most something, I, I, it's not something I'm super familiar with, this logic stuff. Um, then it's the same as having the same number of homomorphisms from graphs of tree depth at most K. Um, so there's that. Uh, he and his, some other people, I think, have not, some other results, sh I think, showing that you can get an undecidable relation on graphs. So this planar graph thing being undecidable is not the first example of that. But there, I think, the family of graphs they look at is, it's just kind of constructed to get this undecidability. It's not kind of like a nice naturally described, it's like, I think they can encode like any Turing machine or something into some class of graphs and then they can get any kind of complexity they want or something something along those lines, I think. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, so it gives you something which is like, it's just a bunch of like isolated vertices and maybe some paths or something and you have to, can only take certain types of them. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I haven't looked at the, pr the proof in detail. And I don't know if there's much other. Uh, I mean, okay, if you do cycles and paths, then it's uh, co-spectral and your complement's co-spectral. Um, so, oh, and I, oh, I guess I should say uh, for, if you do outer planar graphs, I think I, I think I had that sorted out. And that's, uh, I believe this should be equivalent to this kind of semi-definite relaxation of, of, uh, of isomorphism that you can, that you can define also kind of based on these games, but I don't, want to go into detail. So. I'm, I'm not sure if you're going to go into it, but like, uh, does connectedness, connectedness play a large role uh, anywhere here with, in terms of these graphs? Like, you know, I know when you go to trees, right, you're, you're talking about connected. Like you're not, uh, I mean, okay, uh, trees could be replaced by forest and it wouldn't make any difference. Oh, really? Okay. okay. Yeah, the thing is, I mean, um, if I know the number of homomorphisms from, say, uh, two different graphs to some fixed graph, I can take the disjoint union and it's just multiplying. Like the number of homomorphisms from the disjoint union is just multiplying those two numbers. Oh, right, I see. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And so somehow that doesn't that doesn't change anything. Right. right. I see. Yeah. Um, now, if you you could, I mean, I think I mentioned this result by Grow and some others where they get this undecidability. There, they do have some unconnected graphs, but it just means that um, they don't they don't have like in their class. It's not closed under say taking subgraphs or anything like that. Uh, so they'll have like if you have something in your class which is just like the disjoint union of many things, you might not have each individual one of those things in your class. And so this is going to give you some homomorphism counting number. Uh, which you could determine from these kind of smaller ones, but you don't have those smaller ones. So it's giving you less information 
Um, so somehow like closing under disjoint union doesn't change anything, uh, but closing under say taking connected components would change, right? Um, would you expect anything interesting to happen between planar graphs and all graphs? Okay, so what I suspect happened is that if you give me a class of graphs which is closed under minors and disjoint union, uh, uh, give me any two different classes of graphs that's closed under minors and disjoint union, then you get a different relation. I think that's what happens, but um, I don't know. Maybe maybe that's too optimistic, or, could, could or maybe you, not optimistic enough. So so what if you what if you took planar plus a vertex or something like that, like an apex is maybe the easiest way you can make a minor close class slightly more interesting. Maybe yeah, I mean. I, I don't know what's going to happen. It's I, I think it will give you something strictly between quantum isomorphism and, and isomorphism. That's what I think will happen, but I don't think I could tell you anything more. I mean, I can't even really tell you that except for as conjecture, but I, uh, I, I, even as conjecture, I couldn't tell you anything more than that. Right. So, uh, I, cause I mean, somehow it's hard to see exactly what's the relation between these classes and, and the relation you get. Uh, if you just take, some arbitrary class. Mm -hmm. um, I think, uh, yeah, I, I think it's hard to go that way around, I, I guess. I don't know. Um, okay. Any other questions? Okay. Sorry, right, what so, about the, sorry, what about the dimension of the, uh, like, uh, does the dimension play a role, like in the dimension of the C star algebra you get and like anything to do with the graph? Um, I mean, I have no idea, basically. Um, okay. So that would be interesting, I think. Of course, this is somehow related to this undecidability, right? Because if you, like, I mean, in terms of the planar graphs, uh, the fact that it's undecidable has to do with the fact that you don't know how big a planar graph to check. And in terms of uh, this dimension, you don't know how big a dimension or possibly infinite dimensional uh, that you need to check uh, for quantum strategy, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know any direct relation between these two things, other than they're both related to the undecidability of the problem. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about some like quick applications. So what it, one thing we could get from this is that we get a certificate for when two things are not quantum isomorphic. Okay, it's an undecidable problem, but I mean, maybe we get lucky, right? Um, and how do I convince you that two graphs are not quantum isomorphic? Um, I mean, starting already from this first paper, we had some nice uh, necessary conditions, but if we, you know, run out of, we exhaust those, then what do we do, right? But now actually we have a, a complete list of necessary conditions. So, okay, we just keep checking and hope that we get something, right? So we can show that, for instance, the, the Rook graph and the Strachanda graph are not quantum isomorphic. We could show this before, but it was kind of a, a tedious argument showing that some certain quantum graph invariant is not the same for the two graphs, right? Um, but now it's just, okay, well, the Shrikanda graph doesn't have any K4s, so the number of homomorphisms from K4 to the Shrikanda graph is zero, but the Rook graph does have K4, so, um, so that's, that's it, you're done. It's, you know, one line or something. Um, okay. Actually, yeah, okay. Um, so that's nice, um, uh, and this, this seems to work like pretty good. I mean, you wouldn't expect many graphs to be quantum isomorphic, like if you just randomly pick them. Uh, and even the ones where you can't rule it out using so previous results, it seems like you just start trying some planar graphs and you usually get pretty lucky because they shouldn't be quantum isomorphic, right? Because it, it should be rare, I think. Okay, there's this interesting connection to the full color theorem. Um, this is maybe more, uh, not very practical, I think, but, but interesting. So we had these two quantum isomorphic graphs. I'll just call them G and H here. Um, it turns out that um, the graph G has both clique and chromatic number four. And what this means is that any graph has a homomorphism to G if and only if it has a full coloring. Because if it has a homomorphism to G, I can compose that with the full coloring of G and I get a full coloring of my graph. And if it has a full coloring, then I can just use the full coloring of F to map F to a, a full clique in G. Um, but since they're quantum isomorphic, we know that any planar graph has a homomorphism to G if and only if it has a homomorphism to H. 
because actually the number of such homomorphisms is the same. Um, but actually this graph H, it doesn't have chromatic number four, it has chromatic number five. So somehow it, in principle, it's easier to have a homomorphism to H than it is to G. Um, so uh, maybe it's somehow easier to show that your planar graph has a homomorphism to this graph H. Now, I don't think that's actually gonna be the case. Um, and in fact, this specific example, I think you can just kind of, you can prove this without using the, the result actually. You can, um, you can show that, uh, uh, that if your planar graph has a homomorphism to H, then it must be four colorable uh, using some other, some classical techniques, I will say. I, I won't go into detail, but you can do that. Uh, but maybe there are some other examples of quantum isomorphic graphs where, where you can't do it using classical techniques. Anyways, it's, I think it's something that's interesting, if not very practical for, for doing anything. Okay. All right, so that's, that's kind of the end of the first part, and now I have about 10 minutes left, but uh, that's okay. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the proof. And as I said, I can't go into full detail. So um, the proof relies on a connection to quantum groups. And that's really where I'm gonna leave out the details. I'm not gonna go into quantum groups very much because um, it takes some time. Uh, but I do have slides about that. If you wanna ask later, I can explain a bit. Um, so the first, uh, the first thing is uh, I need to introduce something called an intertwiner. I'm just gonna introduce the classical version. So an LK intertwiner of the automorphism group of a graph. Uh, this is just some, some matrix. The, the entries are just complex numbers. Um, it's uh, rows indexed by L tuples of vertices and, and uh, columns by K tuples of vertices. And I require that um, it satisfies this equation. So if I take the Lth tensor power of, of P times T, it's equal to T times the Kth tensor power of P, where P is some element are the automorphism group of my graph. So I'm thinking of the elements as permutation matrices. Okay. Um, and actually it's these, uh, these intertwiners, they're just the matrices that are constant on the orbits of the automorphism group uh, acting on the L plus K tuples of my, of my vertices. So by that, I mean the, the row index of T is a L tuple of vertices and the column index of T is a K tuple. So I just take, I concatenate these two tuples and this gives me an L plus K tuple. And I require that whatever the entry of T is in, in this position, it only depends on the orbit of this L plus K tuple. Right? So this automorphism group, it acts on vertices, but it induces an action on the, on the tuples as well. Okay? So you can just imagine in the, let's say L equals one K equals zero case, uh, this is just going to be the span of the characteristic vectors of my orbits. Okay. Okay, and there's another characterization of these, these intertwiners. Uh, they can actually be generated by just four uh, matrices. So here, I'm, I'm taking these four matrices and then I'm closing under the operations of matrix product, uh, tensor product, conjugate transposition and linear combinations. That's what this notation with these uh, angle brackets means. And then these, uh, these four things, well, A sub G is just the adjacency matrix. This U is just the all ones vector, actually. This M is called the multiplication map. It just maps EI tensor EI to EI. And if it's uh, EI tensor EJ, where I and J are different and annihilates them. And then this swap map S, it just takes EI tensor EJ and maps it to EJ tensor EI. Okay, uh, and so this is for the classical automorphism group. Uh, and then for the quantum automorphism group, it's the same thing, but we just drop this swap map. And these intertwiners are sort of what we're gonna be interested in. Um, right, so here's a very, very high level overview of the, of the proof. So we, we can characterize this quantum isomorphism in terms of these intertwiners of the quantum automorphism group. And this is similar to, okay, I can characterize isomorphism in terms of the orbits of the automorphism group with the disjoint union, right? If I have two connected graphs, then they're isomorphic if and only if, when I look at their disjoint union, there's an orbit containing a vertex from both of the graphs, right? Because that means I can swap those components of the disjoint union. And this is similar. So what we want to do is to develop a combinatorial description of these intertwiners um, in terms of planar graphs. 
Uh, and then we're going to use this to get our combinatorial characterization of quantum isomorphism. Okay, so to do this, we need something called a bilabel graph, uh, which was uh, uh, introduced by uh, Lovas in this book on graph limits. But actually, uh, is Bill Martin here? I don't know. Um, anyways, he's recently put a paper up on the archive where apparently, uh, I guess, the same sort of thing is introduced, was used by uh, Neumeier um, a long time ago. He calls them scaffolds but I think they're very similar. Um, so. Anyway, so what's a bilabel graph? It's just a triple. The first thing is a graph. And then the second thing is an L-tuple of vertices. And the third thing is a K-tuple of vertices. So that's not super interesting. Um, so here's an example. I have K4 as my graph. And then the first, uh, the first tuple uh, is uh, 2, 1. And then the second tuple is 2, 2. Okay. All right, but I want a nice way of drawing these bilabel graphs. I can draw a graph, everyone knows how to do that, but I want to somehow add the, the tuple information to this picture. So what I do is I just draw these little, call them wires, and I draw them thinner and lighter uh, so that you can uh, distinguish them from edges. And what I do is for this first tuple, I usually call this the output tuple, uh, the first wire on the left is going to go to the first entry of that tuple. So here on the left, I have this uh, wire and it goes down to two. And I can tell it's the first wire because on the left, I just, I, uh, I put them in the correct order on the left side of the diagram and similar on the right. Uh, so the first thing goes to two, the second, the second uh, output wire goes to one. And then on the right, both of the wires go to two because the tuple is just two, two. So that's how I draw these things. Okay, and now here are some particular bilabel graphs that have been suggestively named. Okay. Uh, so all of these except for A don't have any edges. They just have vertices and wires. A has one edge. Okay, and I need to get some matrices out of these bilabel graphs in order to characterize my intertwiners. So how do I do that? I do that with what's called homomorphism matrices. Um, so I'll do an example where I just have uh, a one-one bilabel graph. So I just have one wire on the left and one wire on the right. And so what I do is I fix some graph G, and I have my bilabel graph F. And now for every uh, pair of vertices in in my graph G, my my UV entry of this homomorphism matrix, which I write as T to the F is just equal to, it's the number of homomorphisms from the graph F to G that maps um, the first vertex, um, sorry, it maps the vertex from my first tuple to U and maps the vertex from my second tuple to V, okay? So the entries of this matrix are just, if I added all of them up, it would just be all of the homomorphisms from F to G, but I'm partitioning them according to the images of this A and B. Okay, so here's my example with this A bilabel graph. Uh, and of course, if I look at the UV entry, um, I need that U and V are adjacent because I need this to be a homomorph. So I need one, uh, I need one to be mapped to U and two to be mapped to V, and so they should be adjacent. Um, and so I, I get a one, and, and once, once I have that, I, that completely specifies the homomorphism. So it's either gonna be one or zero. So if they're adjacent, I get one homomorphism and I get zero otherwise, okay? But this is of course just the adjacency matrix of my graph, right? So this is a way of encoding the adjacency matrix in terms of these bilabel graphs. Okay. Uh, and then similarly, you can show that these bilabel graphs, uh, U arrow and M arrow, the homomorphism matrices actually independent of the graph is equal to this uh, U, U intertwiner and M intertwiner from uh, the earlier slides. Okay. So now I've encoded, and remember this A sub G, U and M, these are the things that generated all of the intertwiners for my quantum automorphism group. So I've encoded those, but now I need to encode the operations uh, under which these intertwiners are closed. So the tensor product, the matrix product, and conjugate transposition. So how do I do the products? Um, well, what I do is I just take my two bilabel graphs. I need their kind of uh, dimensions, so to speak, to match up. So I need the number of wires on the right of one of them to be equal to the number of wires on the left of the other. But then I just draw them next to each other and I join up um, the wires that are in the middle there. 
And then I can track those wires. So I identify the vertices at, the, at their, the ends of those wires. And I end up with some new bi-level graph. I keep my, the left-hand wires from the graph that's on the left and the right-hand wires from the graph that's on the right. And I get this new bi-level graph. All right, does that make uh, sense? <laughs> okay, so here's a more concrete example. So here I'm taking the product of these two bi-level graphs. And you can see that I get a loop on this one vertex on the right there because um, when I do the multiplication, the wires coming out of vertex three, they go, it goes to uh, vertex A and vertex C. And then those, are, those get identified, but I had an edge between them, so I get a loop. Multiple edges I can ignore. I can just replace with a single edge, but I need to keep in mind loops. Okay. So that, that's how you do graph product. And tensor product actually is just, uh, I put one bilabeled graph on top of the other bilabeled graph, sort of vertically. Uh, so uh, that's, that's uh, a lot easier actually to, to understand. And then for conjugate transposition, this is just swapping the left wires with the right wires. So I kind of just reflect the graph if, I, if you like. Okay, so we have that the intertwiners of my quantum automorphism group, they're generated by just these three matrices. Um, so we want to know what are the bilabeled graphs that are generated by these three bilabeled graphs and these operations on bilabeled graphs. Okay, and it turns out uh, that we can get a nice characterization. So to, to give the characterization, I need to give this definition quick. So here on the left, I have just a bilabeled graph, uh, F. And on the right, I've redrawn, or I've drawn sort of this uh, F sur graph. So in the middle, I just have the graph F from my bilabel graph. But now for, for every wire, uh, I've replaced that with an edge that goes to these, uh, this cycle. Uh, so for every wire, I make a vertex on this cycle and I put those vertices in the, I make the cycle sort of go in the order of those wires. Um, and then I connect with an edge now, not just a wire, um, the, the vertex in the cycle corresponding to the, uh, to a given wire and the, the vertex that that wire goes to in my graph F. Okay. And I call this cycle that I'm, that I've added the enveloping cycle. Okay. And then my class of bilevel graphs that I'm interested in are going to be the bilevel graphs such that this F circ has a planar embedding with the condition that this enveloping cycle can be embedded so that it's bounding, let's say the outer face, it can be any face of course, but let's we think of it as the outer face. And then the theorem is that actually, these are exactly the bilabel graphs that we get using, that, we, that are generated by these uh, three uh, matrices. Uh, and I think I'm at time, so I'll just, this is just a, a graphical proof of the, that fact. Uh, and I'll end there. Thank you, David. Are there any questions? Yeah, I'll, I'll start. I mean, I think this is sort of just what you were getting to there. But what I was going to ask was, um, at what point in this sort of process or investigation, it became clear that it was planar graphs that that was the class you needed to be looking at? So I think this really comes from looking at, um, so let's go back a few slides. Um, ah, here we go, okay. So um, we see here these four, these four bilabel graphs. Remember this, this um, swap map that we also needed for the classical case. Um, so, Essentially what this, this, for the bilevel graph, this kind of S bilevel graph, what this allows you to do, it allows you to cross edges. Okay. And without that, you kind of can't. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know if I recall exactly when we realized it's planar, but I think that was pretty quick. Uh, just because, I mean, if you, if you look at this bilabel graph, right, you can see, okay, the wires are crossing, right? right. <laughs> and none of, the, for right. none of the other three, you, you, do you get any wires crossing? Um, and so, I mean, we, we knew it had to be some class of graphs that probably there wasn't all the graph, all the, I mean, wasn't all the graphs. 
Um, I mean, planar is like, you know, it's going to be one of the first classes that comes to mind, I guess, if you start mm -hmm. thinking about classes of graphs that, that you're familiar with, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think, uh, I think just because we knew this, the difference between the classical and the quantum was this S bilabel graph. I think that's what really made us realize that it was planar, uh, these planar things. Neat. Um, Thanks. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I mean, the way we sort of came about this is that um, we were, I mean, so these, these people that study quantum groups, uh, they, uh, they, in a certain sense, have a nice way of drawing intertwiners, not for quantum automorphism groups of graphs, but for some other types of quantum groups. But they kind of didn't really know what to do about this adjacency matrix. So they would have these kind of nice diagrams with something similar to, say, these wires and these and whatnot. Um, but then for the adjacency matrix, they would just draw like a box and write A on it or something, right? Um, and so they didn't know how to interpret this in a graphical way, I guess. And I guess part of the problem is that these wires and edges look the same. So if you already have something that looks like edges, you don't think, hey, it should be, it should be an edge because you already have edges. Um, but that turns out to be the right way. And the way we figured it out is we just kind of looked at some specific example that we built and then compute it, okay, what's the entries of this thing, right? Sort of a very kind of dumb, like undergrad, I guess. I shouldn't say undergrads are dumb, that's kind of mean, but I mean, somehow like just the, what, I don't know anything to do, but so let's just compute the entries, right? You usually don't get a lot by just looking at the specific entries of a matrix. That's not always true, but often like, you wanna think of it kind of on a higher level, right? Um, but then we did that and we realized, oh, it's kind of count, it's just counting homomorphisms from this one graph to the other one, exactly. And then from that, I think we very quickly realized what the end result was gonna be. Cool. So where do you, uh, where do you go from here? Uh, like, is there anything else that you, uh, like open questions that you're you know, thinking about or willing um, to say on recording? <laughs> No, yeah, I um, I don't think, yeah, it's fine to say it on recording. I don't know how many people are going to view the video, right? There. <laughs> but uh, hopefully a lot. Um, um, I mean, I mentioned this thing about outer planar graphs. I think I have, um, I have, I think I have that worked out. That two two graphs have the same number of homomorphisms from any outer planar graph, if and only if some nice characterization. Um, of course, there's many other classes you can try, um, but yeah, I don't have one specific thing uh, in that regard. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think what else. There are other types of quantum groups um, that you could look at. Um, and this is something that I've thought about a bit with some other people. So this quantum automorphism group for a graph, this is kind of looking at this quantum symmetric group then you add this extra relation that this that uh, has to do with the adjacency matrix of your graph. But you could look at, say, the quantum orthogonal group and then add the same sort of relation. And again, these intertwiners are going to correspond to bilabel graphs. You have to figure out what, actually, I think in that case, we, ha we have sorted out what, what the bilabel graphs are. Um, but you could look at other, there are many examples of these quantum groups that you could look at and try to add different sorts of uh, relations based on graphs based on graphs and then see, okay, what are the intertwiners that you get? What kind of relation on graphs could you possibly get by looking at this? Um, yeah. Um, I'm sure there are other things I just haven't really, don't have it on the top of my head at the moment. <laughs> One thing I, I mentioned this thing about the, um, if I have, if I, you give me any two classes that are closed under minors and disjoint union, then this should give me, these should give me distinct relations on graphs by counting homomorphisms from these classes. So um, that I would really like to be able to prove. Um, yeah, I was yeah. thinking about that. I'm, I'm not really uh, clear on like what the, like, is there, this maybe sounds like a really stupid question, but like, what's the characterization, like connection between, you know, isomorphic graphs and, and minors? Like there might be something about, like, is there any sort of notion in which like, you know, being Q isomorphic is closed under minors? Or is that so, exactly what you're asking? 
the, the reason that I bring up the minor close, it just seems like a lot of these results where there is some characterization, the class is minor close. I guess the exception being cycles, right? If you close that under my, minors, then you get paths and cycles. And then you get, instead of cospectrality, you get cospectrality plus cospectral complements. Um, the fact that the class is closed under minors would Im will imply that the relation you get um, is preserved under taking complements. Um, and I guess that's a nice thing. Um, but other than that, I can't say that there's any, uh, I don't have any really good reason to look at minor closed classes other than they're nice classes. I mean, something even much stronger might be true. Like if you maybe, if you take any just disjoint union closed class, maybe it gives you a different relation. Um, I don't know. Maybe I guess too much. I guess what I'm thinking is like, maybe is there some sort of, um, like, could there be something like functorial going on between the graphs and the algebra of quantum permutations? Like, uh, um, I mean, I, I don't know, maybe. I, I don't even really know how to, I don't know exactly what that means, I guess, uh, sort of. Um, yeah. Um, like if there's something, that, if there's a quantum permutation that relates to graphs uh, and then you you look at them, you like look at minors. Uh, maybe there's some like algebra homomorphism. You look at minors of the graphs. But I guess that doesn't matter because they're already going to be isomorphic. Yeah. That uh, make sense. No, I don't know if there's any relation between like if you take two quantum isomorphic graphs and then you start looking at minors of those those graphs. I don't know if there's going to be any relation there. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, I don't see that. Um, yeah, um, yeah. I, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I can't. I can't say that I have a super great reason for looking at these minor closed classes, other than it seems like they're popping up. You know. Um, there's a question in the chat from Martin. Is there an easy example of a family of graphs closed under contraction and deletion of loops, but not closed under minors? And then in brackets, or is this a stupid question? Closed under contraction and deletion of loops. Oh, where's Peter? He should answer. I guess it's not asking about matroids. So. I think if you want to, if you want to delete an edge, but you're not allowed to delete it, then you can contract it down to a loop. Uh, oh, that doesn't work. Uh, yeah, well, you, but if it's in a cycle, if it's not in a cycle, then it's a bridge. I, I think that there shouldn't be anything non-trivially different between them, but maybe there's some degenerate stuff. No, I, I think I'm wrong to get that. You've embarrassed yourself, Peter. I have. Yep. You helped. Thanks, Chris. Um, are there any more questions for David? Okay, then, uh, wait, hold on. Um, complete graphs. That's from Brenton Rooney in the chat. That's a question? Yeah. I don't know. If, I don't know if it's a question. <laughs> that's the Bill Martin's question. Yeah. Ah. Okay. <laughs> uh, sure. Okay. So if there are no more questions, let's thank David again. Thanks, David. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for listening. <laughs>